This is our very first painting assignment for the course, so we're going to use extremely basic materials. Here I've got a tube of acrylic Mars Black, um, a slow drying agent to increase drying time so it doesn't dry in the palette, a little bit of matte medium, a couple of brushes, and a palette knife. You could probably do this just with a brush and the paint itself, maybe a little water. Um, you could also, if you don't have paint yet and your supplies are on order, you could use um, some ink and a brush. You could use a chisel tip marker or a like super wide Sharpie or something like that. Um, but it'd be preferable to use paint because part of this is um, that we're going to get used to the paint itself. And we're going to do a concept called the Noton, which is a very, very simplified version of a painting. And um, what I'm doing here is just taking a little dab of paint, a little bit of that slow drying agent and some matte medium and mixing them together. I think about a quarter size of paint, a couple of drops of the slow drying agent and some uh, matte medium to kind of thin it down is uh, about right. Maybe and you can play around with, with the matte medium that you have and the paint that you have. It kind of depends on the materials you have as to how much of that you will need. Um, you're looking for a consistency like cottage cheese, kind of, where it's um, a little bit goopy, not going to drip, not fluid exactly, um, and able to kind of pull it across the paper. And here I'm just using paper. Um, it's 140 pound paper, watercolor paper, and haven't primed it or prepped it or anything. Um, the idea behind this course is to put a lot of mileage and uh, do things very simply. So the Noton is all about essentially one thing. It's making a decision between what is dark and what is light, what is in shadow and what is in the light. So here we have sort of an engine housing. Um, and this one's a little bit tricky because there's a lot of ambient light, there's a lot of reflected light, but we can use some clues in the background. You'll notice that there's a cast shadow on the wall and on the ground, and so we're going to bump that up, and you can kind of see where on the actual housing itself, you can see where some shadows are developed. You can see the shadow inside really clearly, and... Uh, our goal here is to sort of begin to interpret where these shadows are. And here I'm using a, a, a round brush and kind of doing a little bit of line work, but I've decided to quickly abandon that and go into like where I've got about a half inch brush and kind of just start covering more ground. Um, and here, what I'm thinking in terms of is just shape. I'm not really thinking in terms of line or form or structure or anything. I'm thinking of shape and I want to be sure to get the two dimensional shapes right. So when I have that line in the background, I'm really thinking that's the line that differentiates the foreground object from the background object. And when I drew that line, I knew that that line mostly needed to belong to the background because I don't want to get into the habit of just sort of painting in a linear way, uh, because if I'm doing that, I might as well just draw. And um, that's fine to do, but what we want to start thinking of is in terms of like large mass, mass shapes, blocks of value and blocks of color. And in this case, we're, we're only going to use um, black for the dark. So you could make an argument that this is kind of a drawing thing because we're using the white of the paper and we're not going to use any white paint. The next assignment we're going to get into some white paint and be able to kind of work back and forth in our notons. But for now, we're just keeping it really, really simple and starting to think about shapes. So there are variations in that shadow on the actual engine housing, but I'm eliminating all of those little variations because all of that belongs to the shadow side. There's a shadow on the 
I-beam support behind that. So I'm going to exaggerate that and turn that into a kind of a triangular shape. That triangular shape is also going to help define the back boundary of the engine housing. And then some of the support studs have little shadows. And so I can start to exaggerate those and create a grid of those behind. And that way I have these vertical lines that can help me differentiate every little bit of the background here. And I think that that's that little subtlety, right? Even though the lines that I'm making are much bigger than they are in the reference photo, those lines help to find the actual object and the actual shape of the object. So that's another concept to think about with the Noton is this is kind of the minimum that you need to differentiate one thing from another. And you'll find situations where you have the shadow side of an object and a big shadow behind it, and you see no difference between the shadow and the environment or the object in the environment. And that is when you would probably need to introduce a third value, um, introduce some halftone. So um, that's important just to keep in mind for later. But for now, we're just going to push shadows around and not worry about the consequences of that too much right now. Um, so here I'm kind of changing the shadow shape to kind of make a little more sense. Uh, in the reference photo, there's a lot of ambient light that hides some of the shadow. So I am over exaggerating this shadow, shadow shape to kind of help this along. Part of this exercise is to begin to figure out how you want to interpret these shadows. And the way that you interpret these, I think, is a big part of what eventually becomes your style. You're making decisions and you're making choices along the way that help guide the eye around. They draw emphasis to things. Whether you want them to or not, that's what's happening. The trick is to kind of get control of that. So the first stage is just finding some shapes that you can use to differentiate. And we want to keep it very simple, keep it um, specific to the object that we're drawing. We don't want to go overboard with too many details. Because one of the things that's happening too is that if you went overboard with details, you start getting too caught up in the little things that don't make any real difference to the painting. What makes a real difference to the painting are the large shapes and the, the quality of those we're balanced off with some medium sized shapes, which is kind of what we're doing now, and then finished off with some little teeny shapes. And if you clutter with too many of one, you kind of lose sense of what's going on. So we've established our large shapes now. And so now we're getting into the point where we're going to um, have to fuss a little bit to get representative small shapes. So looking at the other kind of objects in the background behind here, there's little things that we can pick up on and we can use to help differentiate these objects from each other. Um, we can continue the sort of constructed areas in the back where you use some of the uh, corrugation and some of the I-beams and studs that support the walls. Um, but what's happening now is like the main thing, the main work is done. We can now see where all of the edges of the engine housing are. And that I think is important. Um, everything else is just kind of bonus. And we can start thinking about how these shadow shapes are composed. We want to be sure to take the paint all the way out to the edge. Um, the other concern too is that you're working with a physical medium and you can only get so small with the brushes that you have available. So here, take a minute to sort of reset. If you need to put more paint on the palette, do so. Um, if you need to pause the video and take a break, do that. 
And uh, we're shooting for roughly five minutes for one of these studies, definitely less than 10. Uh, 10 is like kind of the upper limit of what you want to do um, because we just want to get through about five of these and use that as our most basic um, exercise to kind of warm ourselves up. And um, I still do a lot of these sketching and, and do a lot of these digitally as well. So I think it's uh, just something to keep in your toolkit to do on a fairly regular basis. So now we're on to a different reference. Um, this time we're going to be focusing on more of a, a rounded box form of an object, a little sewing box. And the trick here is to show off everything that we need to do with the form. Um, and make it suggestive of this particular sewing box. So there's an obvious dark side of, of this box, and I think that's a really good place to start. So all I've done is kind of made a cutoff triangular shape to make this side of the box happen. And then I know that I'm going to lose that edge into shadow um, because there's a cast shadow behind it. And I need to think about how this is a rounded box as well and how I'm going to interpret that rounding. There's some little teeny seams in the construction as well. So I need to think about that. And here's where I begin to kind of lose distinction between object and background. And this is what I was talking about before, where the weakness of the noton is the lack of differentiation, but the strength is the visual impact and the simplicity of it. Um, if you can get it, what it does is it gives you a strict look at the very core of an image. And if you can get these notons to work in black and white, you can get anything to work um, after that, right? You can even use this as the foundation of a painting and come back and continue it directly on top of the noton if you wanted and differentiate shadows within these shadow shapes and begin to build a painting off of this noton. Many people do. You can sketch them out in pencil or pen or marker um, or some ink and then use that as a reference for how you're going to paint the painting, keeping in mind where the shadow locations are. So now I'm getting into some of the details. I kind of have to group uh, some reflected shadows and some reflected light together to create this shadow of the little boxy structure on the front of the box. And this little structure is going to do a lot for me in terms of getting the overall form to work because I have that large shadow under it. And that's going to imply the fact that there's a box sticking out of another box. And um, the way that I'm going to have to differentiate the top is through that handle. So what's convenient is there's a nice set of uh, curves and lines that we can use to indicate that handle. And this is going to be highly, highly oversimplified because of the nature of, of what we're doing and the size of the brush that I'm using. Um, that's the interesting thing, too, is when you use a large brush, it forces you into to approximating a little more. And I think that's a good thing. So this is a six by eight piece of paper and a half inch brush. So I can't get super detailed ever with it. Um, that shape that I just put there is probably too big. Um, if I had some white paint, I would come back and shrink that down. And then I just painted on it more and it got worse. <laughs> the nice thing about the notons though is that um, you can mess up and it doesn't matter because you've only spent about five minutes on the thing. Um, the quantity, I think, is the advantage of these as well. You know, you're not using that much paint, you're not using that much time, and you're going through this very quickly to work on just a very basic core of the image concept. 
which is light dark distribution and the basic overall shape of everything. So here um, I can see a little bit of differentiation and so I'm using um, some soft edges to kind of find that corner and turn it around. Um, since this is a rounded edge, I'm going to use actually a little bit of halftone and kind of cheat. Um, it's kind of a lame way out of, of the rounded corner problem. Um, but I felt like it was necessary for this one. And I think it'd be better for a Noton to have a, a hard edge and to not kind of soften this and to make a clear decision about where those edges are. But um, again, I felt like this kind of needed it because that edge is rounded and you can kind of see some obvious transition there. Um, maybe if I were approaching it differently, um, if we had three values, I would definitely use uh, sort of a, a third value there to kind of um, help differentiate that whole thing. And here I wanted to clean up that the actual outer contour. Sometimes when you're working with a shadow shape like this, if you add specifics to the contour, it can really, really help a lot. Um, sometimes you need a, a, a more detailed, smaller brush to get those distinctive details. Um, and I guess that's part of the note on too, is that you're trying to simplify it, but you're also trying to be very clear about what the object is that you're drawing or painting and um, how you can create the essence of that. This one's tricky because this one has multiple light sources and it's like this weird like jade or some other rock. Um, so the surface is, it has like a patina on it. Um, it's got a white background, so the shadows aren't real deep and the structure is kind of a little strange. So this one's a, this one's kind of a challenge. And the way that I chose to approach this is pay less attention to the, um, uh, monkey itself and more attention to its surroundings in order to create a composition. So the obvious place to start is with the box because you can see the front and left sides are obviously uh, shadier. And then working behind that into the shadow that the monkey casts, that also defines the floor or the ground on which that box sits. So that gives you, gives you the opportunity to define a bunch with a couple of shapes. Um, here, I'm working on kind of the base of the monkey and finding the arc. And then I want to just put a couple of, of distinctive shapes that I see um, where this monkey is, is sort of sitting. So I'm going to kind of round that out and sink back uh, just inside the legs. And then there's a shadow shape that kind of goes out along the snout and on the front of the nose. And um, I probably need some kind of arc or curve to define the ear. Um, yeah, and this is very, um, this is a very blocky process too, you know, this isn't, we're not going for super precision. We're just kind of suggesting some ideas and how we might accomplish those. So you kind of set, see that it, it almost looks like a koala or something sitting down on a little box. Um, which I think is a good place for it. So behind it, fortunately, we have a shadow. So that shadow shape behind it, um, we can use that to define the upper part of the, the head. And we can change it just a little so it overlaps a little bit more so that it defines the side as well. And then it also gives us a nice compositional shape. So that the background's not just this pure white boringness. 
Now, if we were painting this and we wanted this to be realistic, we would probably take that shadow in the background up to about 50% gray and the whole, almost the whole sculpture here would be dark, um, like 50% or darker with a couple of bright highlights to kind of mm, get the local color correct um, and make the background look white. But for the purposes of Noton, if it's a shadow, you have to put black. So that's kind of the rule. And um, if you follow it strictly, it can lead you into some funky places. Um, it's a different way of working and a different way of thinking, you know? And that's what I like about it, is that it, it makes you be very clear about where the shadows are. And you can spend a long time like rendering and learning to kind of polish your paintings and doing things very realistically and never have a clear idea of where light begins and shadow ends. And, um, you know, I think we're doing the opposite. We're, we're starting off with clear definitions of shadow. And I think that's going to make for uh, stronger painters for all of us, you know, and, um, I'm going through this course with you too. Remember, I'm not just here to teach. I'm here to, I'm here to learn. And as I make all these things, I discover more. And as I discover more, I'll definitely pass that info onward. And I want you to see all, in all these demos that, you know, I don't make perfect paintings and I don't think that it's super necessary on any one painting to have it perfect. What matters is that you practice the skill um, and add something to your toolkit. The nice thing about this exercise is it's roughly a five by five. So you're doing like five minute paintings. It's pretty easy to sit down for about a half an hour and knock these out. I'm painting on a six by eight format. There's no reason why you couldn't do this on a three by four size. Um, and work your way through pretty readily. Um, I'm using these particular reference photos. You can use these for reference as well, or take your own reference photos. I think um, if you plan on making any kind of art in the future uh, after, after this kind of course, you should definitely definitely start taking reference photos and go through the photos that you have um, in your photo archives and start thinking about how they could be used or if they could be used for references um, because you need references that are your own um, one for copyright infringement and two because it's just more interesting that way um, so here i decided to begin with like the most obvious shadow which is that back plane of this camp stove. Um, and then the shadow behind that in the back corner really defines uh, a huge part of the format. It defines that whole upper right corner. It defines the um, right side of the windscreen on the stove. And it, it buys a lot of differentiation for very little work. So here I've got the front of the stove and some of the ground shadow that are going to kind of get grouped together. Um, so I haven't decided exactly where the front of the stove is yet, but I can be pretty sure it's somewhere around there. One of the neat things about the Noton is if you know there's a shadow in a specific area you don't necessarily have to be immediately accurate with it you just kind of go somewhere in the middle of where that shadow is going to go and put some value down there as sort of a note to self and then you can work your way outwards expanding to the right sort of area um, and this is the challenge of using only black to do this is that you can't go back and make changes in the other direction when we add white in the next assignment we'll be able to correct ourselves. So we'll be able to, to draw these shadows out and then make changes as we go along. Um, so here, there's certain things that 
are distinctive about this particular object. The windscreens are kind of like, or the windshields are a little tilted and they're a little off and there's these little gaps um, all over the place. Um, you'll see there's a lot of detail um, that we want to eliminate, but a certain amount that we want to include. One of the trickier things about this one is that you can see that there's a, a door right to the left of it. And technically this whole thing is in shadow from the light coming through the door. So this is one question that we have. It's like, how do we interpret that? Do we put a shadow over that whole ground plane or do we not? Um, I think if we, you know, if we put the shadow over the whole ground plane, we wouldn't have much to show, but it's possible, I think, because you would get a little bit of light on the on the kerosene tank and on the left windscreen. So that might be enough for an interesting image. Um, probably not, but it might be. And you could, uh, you could totally go for it if that's how you want to interpret the value. Again, we've got corrugations behind, and that, that corrugations is going to add interest to the background here, um, the set of corrugations. And... You know, we didn't put legs on here, so it's going to need legs. Um, once you put legs on this sort of thing, it'll be more clear and more obvious what this is um, to anyone kind of looking at it. Next is actually defining that shadow on the ground. Um, I kind of oversimplified this shadow. Like you could probably get a little more interest in the shadow shape um, by bending it around that sort of structure on the back corner where it goes up and over sort of like on a two by four or stud almost, um, can play around with, uh, with sharp and soft shapes, um, or soft edges if you want. Um, you know, if it's rounded, a uh, soft edge kind of works. If it's, um, cast shadow sometimes soft edges work depending on how soft the shadow shape is on metallic objects you may want um, all sort of hard edges so just throwing that idea out there that you know painting is essentially just creating flat shapes with interesting edges and um, you can actually do there's a whole style of painting called graphic painting, which uh, really focuses on that. Um, just, you know, sharp edges, no transition in the value. Um, so here, this is the stage where I'm kind of nitpicking and saying, well, it doesn't really look distinctive. So I need to go in there and get some distinctive sort of patterning. So there's these two sets of three holes in the front around the burners. I'll add those in and that, that'll get a little more distinctive. Then there's the row of holes on the back and I can go ahead and dot those in really quickly. Um, there's also a little bit of a, a two-part structure on the back that allows an extra little line to go across. I could probably fuss with the burners a lot, but I think that would be counterproductive. I could probably sneak in just a little more detail into the windscreen area itself. And then I probably need to add some detail to the kerosene um, canister, uh, just to be suggestive of the dials and the pressure gauge. There, so now that's suggesting that there's something more going on. Call it good there. All right, next one, we're making, we're making our way through. Again, if you need to pause between these, that is encouraged. So if you need to set a timer for yourself, do that too. So this one's a lamp and we can kind of see only one side of it. So at the bottom we have an arc and at the top we have an arc and it's kind of conical in its shape. This one's going to be very simple. And 
simple minimal notons can sometimes be incredibly difficult because you have to be very clear and very deliberate and every little thing you do has to suggest exactly what's going on and that's tricky so now we have a cast shadow going out to the wall i'm also changing the format from vertical to horizontal um, i find doing that really fun sometimes um, but it's also like a little bit tricky So here I needed to find like the corner where the ground and wall meet. And then here I'm going to lose differentiation between the object and the background. Because again, this is a noton. And I don't know exactly what that shape is going to look like, but I assume that that shape changes and goes down. Um, So here I'm just working my way outward from the shadow to kind of hit that shape correctly, which is tricky. And then now that I have the shadow area defined, it's just a matter of filling it in. And I do want to fill this in like relatively carefully and make sure that it does get good coverage. Um, if you have bad coverage, that texture gets a little distracting. Um, so I've worked out the shade and its rough location. So now I need to get the, uh, the, the base of the, and the stand in there. So I've got the shadow side of that cylinder. I've got the cast shadow that cylinder is creating. And then I've got the sort of little disc that it sits on. And that little disc has the shadow on the disc itself and the little bit of cast shadow on the ground, which have to be sort of grouped together. I haven't decided exactly where the, the cylinder ends until then. Um, so now it's pretty well defined. And I think because it's black or dark brown, the cord needs to go in there. And I can actually get the shadow of the cord too. And then um, it's a slightly darker area off to the right where the cord goes. So I think I may need to just, because it's too minimal, I might need to just create a shadow area over to the right. Because that is kind of shady. It's just not really dark. Um, but it also helps differentiate the surfaces that are depicted. So this is one of those things where you could interpret that differently and you would be fine to, to do so. And I think that's what makes artwork and painting interesting is that the same people can look at the same subject and interpret it differently. And I think that's part of like this exercise more than any other shows that, um, that there's multiple ways to approach something. There's decisions you have to make along the way that affect the overall look. And um, one of the nice things is that this is just a simple way to explore it. It's not too difficult um, to approach and it's uh, really cheap and easy to get into because it only requires a tube of paint and a brush. Um, the other sort of supplies are a little more optional. Um, you can make substitutions if you need to and um but you know that matte medium is really nice to have because it just kind of unifies everything and takes all the glare out makes makes stuff easy to photograph um and i left that that one distinctive shadow that that's going to help that base out a lot so you can be sure to get that in so here i'm just kind of fussing with that shadow a little bit um it's probably too big and slightly the wrong shape. I would want to come back in with some white paint and change it um, when we do the other sort of exercise, but that's about it. Um, so these are the, the five notons all kind of stacked up next to each other. Um, you can see that they give you the essence of these objects without a lot of information and in a short amount of time. 
Um, you'll notice that there's a lot of visual impact to these notons, um, which is kind of what we're after. So I want you to give these a shot and you can paint along with this video or time yourself.